Hello, it's Tamsin Taylor here from Colchester Gallery and I love talking about painting and sculpture and architecture and my trip to Florence. So if you like sharing people's holiday snaps with them and going to art galleries you may find my videos rather entertaining. I hope you will. When you arrive in Florence at the railway station, it's called Santa Maria Novella. That's an odd name for a railway station. The reason is that it's near the ancient church of Santa Maria Novella. Well, I say ancient. It's a Dominican church. So it dates from the 1300s and it's called Santa Maria Novella because it is the new church dedicated to the Virgin Mary. The old church, Santa Maria Vecchia, is, um, is quite near and that's just a small church. Santa Maria Vecchia has in it um, an, an ancient icon of the Virgin Mary which is very interesting because it's partly carved. It's in low relief. It's a very lovely image, always with candles in front of it, so it is gleaming in red and black and gold. It's a votive image that people like to go and light the candles and say their prayers in front of it, and it has been used in that way since the 1200s. That's when the icon dates from. Well, the Dominicans needed a bigger church, so they built themselves a grand Gothic church, Santa Maria Novella, and that has a number of very important artworks in it, uh, including a cycle of frescoes painted by uh, the artist uh, Domenico Ghirlandaio and his family. Domenico Ghirlandaio was Michelangelo's teacher so when you think of Michelangelo painting the frescoes on the ceiling of Sistine Chapel, you have to think that even though he was primarily known as the sculptor before he painted that ceiling, he had his apprenticeship initially in the workshop of Florence's most accomplished painter of frescoes, and he probably assisted Domenico Ghirlandaio in fresco painting and so he really did know what he was doing when it came to applying fresco and that is why the ceiling of Sistine Chapel stayed on the ceiling whereas Leonardo's Last Supper fell off the wall virtually as soon as it was painted and it was a, a ruin within a hundred years and the, the colours of the Sending the Sistine Chapel are, um, are they were as fresh as the day that Michelangelo laid them on the plaster. So Ghirlandaio is an important name, probably not one that is well known to the, the average art student, but somebody to look out for in Florence and is particularly well represented at the Church of Santa Maria Novella. It's another very important artist there. As you walk down on the um, left-hand side of the church, there's a painted niche. Now, it's not really a niche. It just looks like one. Architecturally, it looks like a niche. And it has in it a representation of the Holy Trinity. Uh, the Holy Trinity is part of Christian theology it represents God, the Father and Creator, God the Son, the Redeemer and Saviour, and the Holy Ghost, that is the Spirit of God, as um, God works as a healer and inspirer and comforter in hearts of people. So um, this representation of the Holy Trinity is there on the wall an amazing picture because it's an early example of perspective, linear perspective 
and foreshortening of the figures. It's been a, a very inspirational piece of work for a very long time, admired just for its subject matter, but also for the tremendous artistry. And the artist was Masaccio, who unfortunately died as a young man of about 28, leaving his major work, a series of frescoes, in the Brancacci Chapel on the other side of the river, leaving that incomplete. And uh, the other important thing about Masaccio's Trinity fresco is that the plan for the linear perspective for the niche that surrounds them probably devised by Brunelleschi. Now, the name Brunelleschi comes up regularly. He was one of the people from the early 1400s, born in the late 1300s, so he was a young man at the turn of the century uh, when very important things started to happen in Florence. Looking at some of the earlier churches in Florence before getting to the cathedral. The other medieval church of really tremendous significance, apart from Santa Maria Novella, is Santa Croce, the Church of the Holy Cross. And one of the reasons why this is so very important is that it is a bit like the Westminster Abbey of Italy, it is the church that contains so many important monuments, the burial sites of so many important people. Uh, that it's a fascinating place. This is the place where, when Michelangelo's body was stolen away from Rome and um, put into a sack and buried under a pile of produce and brought into Florence, it was buried in Santa Croce and it is there that Michelangelo is represented by a fantastic tomb showing three weeping muses, the muse of architecture, painting and sculpture. Now I could have added to that poetry because it's not a very well-known fact, but Michelangelo was one of Italy's great Renaissance poets. Along with Michelangelo, we have the tomb of Galileo. Now, Galileo, well, he was a bit of a bad boy. His scientific theories about the state of the universe could very well have got him executed but they forgave him sufficiently to bury him in a place of honour, Santa Croce. The other person who has a tomb there is Dante, whose body is not actually in Florence. I think it's in Ravenna, I'm not actually sure. The other reason for going to Santa Croce is that it has numerous chapels, and the chapels are all fabulously decorated by pre-Renaissance or proto-Renaissance uh, fresco artists. So that is just a, a wonderful place to explore if you like looking at fresco painting and following the various narratives of the lives of the saints and things like that and seeing these beautiful altarpieces set into the positions that they were actually designed for uh, so that you have a combination of um, the the altar generally with uh, the Virgin Mary and Christ child at the centre surrounded by saints with a gilt background and then behind it will be um, the life of the Blessed Virgin or the, the nativity of Jesus or the life of the saint such as um, Saint Nicholas who was the patron saint of the particular side chapel. So uh, Santa Croce is a really wonderful place to see that. The other medieval church, which is fantastically important, is the cathedral. There was a church on the site, a church of St. Reparata, and part of that still exists. 
below ground level in what you might call the crypt. But the cathedral, when it was planned, was was planned as an enormous building and it is still to this day one of the biggest churches in the world. One of the things that's extraordinary about it is that it's a Gothic building. Now when you look at Gothic architecture in France you realise that in the progression of Gothic architecture from the 1100s through to the 1400s the buildings got taller and narrower uh, and height was the aim but they were not very wide and in England they were not as tall as in France. The tallest Gothic vault in England I think is Westminster Abbey which is 102 as against Amiens Cathedral's 150 odd feet. Don't ask me to put that into metres. I'm sure somebody could. Maybe I'll work it out and put it in the notes, in footnotes. Anyway, English medieval churches tend to be very long. French medieval churches tend to be not terribly long, but very tall. And either way, they're quite narrow because they have vaults made of, of stone ribs with thinner stone infill between the ribs. Now, when Anolfo de Cambio came to design the Gothic Cathedral in Florence, well, he'd obviously he'd seen Gothic vaulting, but maybe he'd also been to Rome and seen the enormous classical remains there. What he did was build Florence Cathedral on a stupendous scale that you would think almost impossible for a Gothic building. How could a ribbed vault be as high and as wide as the one on Florence Cathedral. How could the piers be so tremendously wide apart? It's a church of the most ginormous proportions. The interior, I might say, is, is not very sweet. It's not a very lovable building. There are some interesting things to see. A couple of interesting frescoes on the walls, three precisely, but it doesn't really endear itself on the inside. It's just stupendously large and the thing that I like about it the best are the absolutely beautiful inlaid stone floors. So what about what is it about the Cathedral of Florence? Well if you're a, a younger visitor and if you're fit able-bodied person then you'll want to climb the bell tower. Uh, the bell tower is freestanding like the famous Leaning Tower of Pisa but it doesn't lean. It's a straight a tower of square plan and it's freestanding from the church the way that Italian towers typically are particularly when they are in alluvial areas near a river the way of both the Leaning Tower of Pisa and Giotto's Campanile in Florence are. A Campanile is a bell tower and the bell tower of Florence is really, really gigantic. It's absolutely spectacular and I have climbed it, headed up there with my youngest son when he was about 11. The whole way up the tower, it, it was evening, the whole way up the tower, Japanese tourists kept passing me saying, you must hurry, you must hurry. So we hurried and uh, when we got to the top, we had no idea why we were hurrying. But they said, if you don't hurry, you will miss it. And what we mustn't miss was the beautiful sight of uh, the full moon rising above the hills and shining over the the valley of um, uh, of the Arno and it, it was definitely worth hurrying in order to see that. It was just wonderful. So Florence Cathedral, I've dealt with the tower but I haven't mentioned its greatest, most famous feature. Anolfo de Cambio from the uh, town of um, Colli Alto 
was the person who designed the cathedral. And like most Christian churches, it's built in the shape of a cross. And where the arms of the cross meet, it was intended to have a great big octagonal dome. But this didn't happen. Back in the 1300s, there was nobody who could achieve that. They knew how it was supposed to look because a representation of it was painted on the wall of a chapel attached to the church of Santa Maria Novella. There it was, for all to see, and no one could do it. It was supposed to have eight ribs in the Gothic manner and uh, tile roofs in between. So around the year 1400, there were two different competitions held, one of which I will talk about a bit later. But um, the second competition was for who could build the dome of the cathedral. And the winner was Filippo Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi had done some archaeological studies in Rome. He had poked around and dug things up and found statues and examined the various ancient buildings. That, uh, far more of the Colosseum was standing back then than is now. Um, one of the popes used it as a quarry in order to build the present St Peter's. But there you are. That sort of thing happened. The buildings of ancient Rome were very useful. Their marble was burnt to form lime and their bricks were simply reused. So Brunelleschi was, was familiar with the most famous building in Rome, uh, apart from the Colosseum, still standing, still intact, because it had been converted into a Christian church. And that was the huge circular building, the Pantheon, the widest dome ever constructed until Nurley's sports dome was constructed also in Rome in the 1950s. The Romans used cement but the main building material of Florence was brick while well, the Romans used brick as well very skillfully but the formula for their cement had been lost. So Brunelleschi had to somehow devise a way of building the huge dome of Florence Cathedral using largely brick. The dome was so tall, so high above the floor, so absolutely vast that it was impossible to use centering under it. What he did was construct eight enormous ribs and fill in the space between them with brick and the the brick was arranged in herringbone pattern so that each layer of brick was very well locked into all the bricks around it and rather than using a huge wooden enormous frame underneath it he just had the dome built out bit by bit by bit by bit by bit in the same way as they built the two arms of the Sydney Harbour Bridge in the 1930s. These two great arcs came out until they eventually met in the middle. Well in the case of the dome of the cathedral they didn't quite meet in the middle uh, because there's a hole in the middle like that in the, on the Pantheon in Rome and um, it has a structure over the top which is known as the lantern and which is a quite substantial almost like a little temple standing up there on top it's a quite a substantial tower in itself the lantern Brunelleschi was not only a fantastic architect he was an absolutely brilliant structural engineer and he was also a brilliant mechanic because he devised a whole lot of uh, various machines in order to hoist the stone and materials up and do all the various things that he needed. And the, the machinery that he invented 
is still on display in the dome of the cathedral. He was likewise a fantastic manager of people and this was part of the success, one of the reasons why the dome was achieved in um, far less time than it was anticipated that it would take. It had eight sections and there were eight important sections to the city. So Brunelleschi got together a team of workers from each sector of the city and then he pitted them against each other and he set down very strict rules. They were not allowed to drink straight wine with their lunch. Their wine was watered down. They were not allowed to go down. Once they had gone up the dome to start the day's work, there they were and anything that needed to come up or go down went up or down in a bucket on a pulley. They did not go downstairs for their lunch. They worked, they worked hard and they worked very effectively and the dome has been remarkably stable. He achieved what was considered impossible. And so that vast dome is the symbol of the city of Florence and the most magnificent thing on the landscape. I recommend to everybody that they go up, they take a bath or they take the very long climb up the hill to the Piazza di Michelangelo and further up to the church of San Miniato al Monte, um, San Miniato on the mountain, and um, from the Piazza di Michelangelo you get a marvellous view of Florence. You can see just how important the dome is and all the little orange tile roofs uh, surrounding it, the sea of orange tiles. It's just a beautiful sight. Now, when you want to visit the cathedral, you buy a ticket that gives you entrance to the baptistry, up the tower and up the dome. So you can do those three things. If you're not up to a long climb, then I recommend you just take a ticket for the baptistry. So I haven't quite dealt with all the churches that are important. I mentioned the Church of the Carmini, which has attached to it the Brancacci Chapel, famous for the fact that Masaccio painted there. Masaccio, uh, back in the early 1400s, worked with uh, another artist called Marcelino, and those two names mean Big Tom and Little Tom. Little Tom, Marcelino, was a lot older than Masaccio, and Masaccio, unfortunately, died before the work was completed. They were painting a life of St. Peter in this chapel. Now, the painting was considered so important because of the three-dimensionality of the figures and the lifelike quality. It was revolutionary in Florentine art in the early 1400s. So revolutionary that various people like Michelangelo, several generations later, went to the Brancacci Chapel and drew some of the figures that had been painted by Masaccio. Uh, you might wonder how it was completed given that he died. Well, Marcelino then worked on part of it and eventually a third artist, Filippino Lippi, completed the frescoes round about 1500. So it, it was nearly 100 years before the frescoes were actually complete. If you're an art student who is particularly studying Renaissance painting, then the Brancacci Chapel has to be fairly high on your list of things that you must visit because it was such an inspiration to other artists. If you are not an art student, I would say uh, don't bother because when you go there, there will be two or three hundred students waiting to gain entrance and it isn't a very big chapel. 
The other important religious site that the uh, lover of early Renaissance painting should go to see is the convent of St Marco. There is a, a church there which has been greatly changed and elaborated over the centuries. So it, it's now mainly a Baroque church with a Baroque facade and um, a gilded ceiling and lots of much later artwork. But the convent next to it contains a marvellous array of treasures. One of the friars at that convent was Fra Angelico, who is now the blessed Fra Angelico. He and his brother both worked there. His brother lettered manuscripts and Fra Angelico illuminated them. Uh, a brother probably did some of the illuminations as well. And Fra Angelico painted. Now, uh, he painted a number of altarpieces. He was already working on them um, in Fiesole before he came to live in Florence. Um, he'd already painted a couple of altarpieces by that time. Uh, one of his altarpieces, which shows the deposition of Jesus, uh, the people taking Jesus down from the cross after his death by crucifixion. And that's a, a very, very famous altarpiece, uh, superbly beautiful. And that is in the little art gallery, which is part of the convent. But the really, really special thing to see is up the stairs, off the cloister. The cloister itself is delightful. And at the top of the stairs, you're confronted by an amazing fresco, a simply beautiful image of the angel Gabriel announcing the birth of Jesus to the Virgin Mary. It's a most charming work of art. And on that level, you find yourself in a series of corridors which surround an inner cloister. And as you walk down the corridors, doors open off to right and left. Each one goes into a monastic cell, a small room where the monk had his bed and a cupboard belongings and a window that looks either out or into the cloister. And there, painted on the wall, adjacent to the window, is a single fresco, arched at the top so that it fits into the shape of the, of the room. They are an amazingly beautiful series of paintings. Very, very simple. No elaboration, no great detail. They tell various aspects of the story of the life of Jesus. One of the most beautiful, most moving is the story of Mary Magdalene seeing Jesus in the garden after he has resurrected from the dead, realising that it's him and going to touch him. And he says, no, don't touch me yet. Go and tell my disciples that I am risen. And um, it's absolutely wonderful. And I, I had the wonderful experience of being in the, in the corridor, kind of walking back to take another look at this and seeing uh, a, this group of noisy teenagers come past me. One girl stopped there and she just looked at this picture and went, this jaw dropping. And a friend said to her, come on, come on. And she said, no, no, I, I've just got to look at this. And she stood there and she looked at it for oh, I don't know how long. And when she'd finally walked away, I said, you have to see the transfiguration, which is just a couple of doors further along. Uh, that's just about as special. If you're a religious person, then getting there at a quiet time and having one of these pictures all to yourself is a very nice experience. 
it's it's really very spiritual experience because obviously the paintings each every one of the paintings was designed as a piece for contemplation of some aspect the Christian faith or of Jesus passion resurrection his death or uh, something of the sort so it's very enjoyable to be able to see them without a group of tourists or noisy school kids pushing and shoving right behind you and um, I've been lucky on a couple of occasions to have had that experience. The Friar Angelica is one of the important people associated with Florence and in particular with the convent of St Mark's.